um, introduce Dr. Campbell Page of uh, TFL Leather Technology uh, to talk about significant changes in um, chemicals used by the tanning industry. Nobody heard you. I'm now going to introduce um, Dr. Campbell Page uh, of TFL Leather Technology, who's going to talk about significant changes in chemicals used by the tanning industry. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Listening to the last speaker, I was thinking in a few years' time when I'm sitting in an old person's home and I put on my, because I was born on a farm and I grew up on a farm and we had wheat crops and all these sorts of things where you, could, you used to go out and feel if they were ripe and these sorts of things. And I can imagine myself sitting in this old people's home with my glasses on and so on and experiencing all those childhood uh, things again, which I, um, yeah, it's an interesting concept. Yeah, I'm sure my children are like it. They just put the glasses on and say, there you are, Dad. Go. Okay. I'm going to talk about chemicals. I've been asked not to talk detailed chemistry, so I will follow this. Uh, so there will be anybody expecting chemical equations and formulas. Sorry, you're out of luck. Which way do I go? This way. Yeah. Um, what I will talk about is we'll have an overview of the chemicals in general with some examples being used today. I want to just mention one or two examples of innovation which from the side of the chemical industry, um, relatively simple example. And one of the things which is having an impact is the regulations, both in terms of legal regulations and the eco labels, uh, global brands and things like this who have their own um, requirements and I would like to just briefly mention those. If you want to consider uh, this topic in detail I can recommend two publications to you. They're both uh, two to three hundred pages long so um, but th there is lots of details in there so anybody who wants details about the impact of chemicals in the industry and so on you can go to this. This is a European Commission document. There was a long period of discussion. All the European uh, players sat together and we discussed this over a period of quite some time and we argued and discussed and, and finally finished up with this nearly 300 page document on best available technologies in the leather industry. It covers a lot of what exists and what uh, is possible and alternatives and things like this. The address is at the bottom, it's on the website. Um, I think the full report might just be in English but parts of it are available in practically every European language. The other document I'm not sure whether people are aware of is the one from UNIDO. It's again about 200 pages long. It's only, a, and again the web address is at the bottom. Don't worry about writing it down. If you put the title into Google, you'll find it. Um, this is still a working document. So what they're actively asking people to do is to read it and comment on it and go back to them. So it's, it's just a working document at the moment, but it's, it's quite an interesting overview uh, from the leather industry in this aspect of sustainable leather manufacture. Okay. I start in the beam house area. This is traditionally you use quite large amounts of fairly basic chemicals in the beam house. Um, the things which are, we've heard about it this morning, sulfide and so on, these types of things. What are changing, things are changing there and the changes are being basically driven to reduce pollution, to reduce smell, to reduce various um, um, emissions to the environment. There are processes available in, in this area which can be used to try and minimize the impact to the environment. There's one that's been around quite some time, HearSave, 
there's low salt processes, there's low sulfide on here, and some people say sulfide free. Okay, but at least low sulfide, ammonia free, enzymatic unhearing can be used in some cases. Lipases are used to partially replace surfactants. These are some of the technologies which are available in order to, from the chemical industry, any of the chemical suppliers can help in this area. And these are the types of things going on. There's quite active work going on in the beam house area. There is, there is, from the side of the chemical industry, there's quite a lot of activity going on in this particular place. Trends. Obviously, the demand for safe, efficient processes with the low impact, the low environmental impact, are going to be the, the way for the future. These are going to be the things which will be promoted and which will be uh, used in the future. I'm sure things like enzymes will continue to be used, and by enzymes I'm also in including other biotechnology uh, products which come out. For example, uh, biochemicals from fermentation of, of various natural products. One question which comes up, uh, very often we hear, I oh, use a natural product, don't use a chemical. Um, it, somebody asked me just a couple of days ago, have you ever actually tested any of these natural products? Do they contain forbidden substances? Do they contain pesticides? Do they contain other products? Do they, in a leather situation, will they emit particular products? In many cases, everybody says, use natural products, don't use synthetic chemicals, but in actual fact, in many cases, they've never been tested. It would be interesting to see how it comes out in some cases. Pre-tanning and tanning. Chrome tanning will remain the universal process. It's not in danger of being replaced. We have other areas, vegetable extract, organic tanning. These tend to be specialist for specialist items uh, and are used extensively for those type of items. Chrome tanning has its challenges. It's got to product problems like when I refer back to our best available technology, I think we spent oh, maybe half a day arguing about what should be the limit of chrome in wastewater. This is a European document, so you can only have one limit. Um, and we had countries who had higher limits and countries who had lower limits. And, but in the document, we can only put one. And I can tell you that was a long argument. So, <laughs> uh, and, and I think even the compromise at the finish was, yeah, <laughs> it was not easily accepted. Um, you have a disposal of chrome containing shavings and other trimmings and things like this. What do you do with them? Uh, landfill is not so, not accepted in many countries. And of course, in an area which I won't go into any detail, but we'll hear from the next speaker possibly more, uh, to avoid formation of traces of chromium-6. This is one uh, thing which is quite important. I just wanted to touch on one area um, because we are involved, especially in this part of Europe um, and especially in going into Germany and Austria and so on. We are very much have a lot of automotive leather being manufactured. Um, and this is one area which is picked up on the organic or the metal free tanning. They have, you see the example there, a very white leather, so that makes, means they can, if they wanted to, develop nice colors. The chrome tan leather has some restriction in colors. Uh, and of course, for shavings, they can be utilized in various ways. They are chrome free, and they can be used in various ways, composted or put into uh, fertilizers and things like this. Uh, in most cases, tanneries using this leather are um, selling off these waste materials for money, so they make money from it. They don't have to dump it. 
I just wanted to, for those, since I've been in the industry for a while, um, and it was interesting because I came across this letter from a German auto manufacturer called Audi. Um, 21 years ago, August 1994, Audi wrote a letter to their suppliers saying that they had decided, this is in German, but uh, for those who can't read it, it's just they have decided in future only to use chrome-free tanned leather in all of their cars. Um, and this was a decision they made in August 1994, and by November 1994, they, were, they had all leathers after that were chrome-free. The point might be why. Were they so environmentally uh, aware in those days? In actual fact, their decision was nothing to do with the environment at all. Today, it might be said to be because of the environment, but at the time, the organic tan leather in their situation, the automotive situation, has a dry heat stability, which is superior to the chrome tan leather. And for this was the reason why they decided to change. Naturally, the ecological benefits uh, have come and been possibly in many cases uh, now everybody thinks that's the reason why. Many automotive manufacturers now use organic tanned leather rather than chrome tanned leather because of reasons like this. So it's, an, it's a specific reason for using it. Um, certainly in terms of shoes and other industries, the chrome tanned leather is the one which has had advantage. If we go to retanning, filling, auxiliaries, we have, this is an area where you tend to put in, depending what type of leather you're wanting to make, you're adding melamine resins, you're adding phenol and naphthalene condensate, syntans, or you're adding acrylic polymers. So this is the standard type of syntans which are around. I think these products will stay. Um, there will be some movement, but the selection of which one you use and how much you use and so on depends very much on the type of leather. So we're not so much talking here a, a pollution problem like for earlier in the beam house, but we're here, your customer gives you a specification and the type of leather they want, and for this, to achieve this, you have to use the particular products. The one challenge that exists is there are, rec there are requirements coming in for residual formaldehyde, residual phenol, naphthalene is being carried through on the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons legislation in America, and that it includes naphthalene. So this will be an impact which we have to consider. There are various things that can be used which are not so long in the industry, softening polymers to, to use to uh, replace some of the traditional syntans and also in the area of fat liquors. Uh, lighter weight filling, there has been in the last years various uh, techniques to include um, filling agents which are, have air, little, there are little bubbles with air in the middle of them. So this idea is to use lighter weight filling agents compared to traditional type of filling agents. And obviously, when you're talking filling, you're looking for products from renewable resources. These are the types of things. Maybe rather than the synthetic tanning agents, retanning agents, you could be looking at products from renewable resources. I think the future there will be, I think, more. We've seen it, more developments based on polymers. Uh, the one thing about the production of polymers is you can control them quite well. You can control the residuals. Uh, this is perhaps a difference to a natural product where you have to take what, you, what nature has provided but on, on the other hand, I still think that we are all looking um, what possibilities we have uh, within the 
natural renewable resources. Excuse me. Okay. Fat liquors, I think this is again a relatively ripe area. In other words, there, there is uh, an area where a huge range of oils and fats, both naturals and synthetics are used. Uh, it's, it's really quite amazing when you go into that area in detail, uh, the type of products which are used. Um, I think the things which will change in that area will depend on specifications from customers requiring particular types of softness or particular types, and especially if you go to the automotive industry again, low emission, these types of things uh, are something which are driving the type of oils and waxes and so on, which oils and fats, sorry, which can be used in these types of products. Uh, again, I think we will see increased use of renewable oils and fats from renewable resources. Uh, some areas possibly will decrease if they can't provide good uh, anti-yellowing properties or they don't yellow with heat and things like this, um, some of these ones will probably go out. And depending on price, this is obviously a price sensitive market. I put chlorinated fat liquors in because this is uh, an area what often chlorinated fat liquors are used as an auxiliary fat fatting agent. So they're not the main fatting agent, but you put them in to give a special effect. The problem is that they tend to be persist relative long in the environment and for this reason um, they are fairly strongly attacked by certain environmental groups. So I think it's something that we have to keep in mind. The future of them might be limited. There are certain European countries already which quite strongly have AOX regulations in their wastewater and things like this. Uh, so these, these sorts of things can have an impact. Dyes, this is an area close to my heart because this is where I've grew up and learned uh, and worked with. We, uh, we use in the leather industry anionic acid and direct dyes mostly, mostly acid dyes but also a number of direct dyes. Um, there's not too much difference between them. Uh, but just the acid dyes were more in the old days for wool, for wool, developed for wool, and the direct dyes were developed for cotton. Um, but they're both anionic dyes. They fix to the leather because of the anionic interaction of the dye and the cationic uh, interaction on the leather. So it's, it's an ionic interaction. There have been attempts to introduce reactive dyes, in other words, covalent bonding dyes, which fix onto the leather, um, but it has not been successful, there's been a couple of systems come out and uh, the volumes are too low to make it economic. The problem you have is the temperature of processing of leather is too low and the pH is also not in the area where you get the optimal uh, fixation of these types of dyes. Future. Well, the dye industry has moved away from Europe. The dye industry is now in Asia, the manufacturing industry. Um, I don't know what the future will be. I see no investment going on in new dye structures. And on top of that, we have the REACH regulation in European countries, uh, which means it's a very high barrier to introducing any product which is of low volume. So um, it's, I'm not sure the future on that's very difficult to predict, but I don't see any new dye structures coming out. Uh, so if you want a Marlboro Red, you have a choice of two or three dyes. And if you can't do it with those two or three dyes, sorry, there isn't anything else there. And there probably never will be anything new. So, this is a, a little bit of a tough situation, but I'm telling it quite bluntly uh, to, uh, to you. Finishing, 
I just looked up and saw the translator. She told me not to talk too fast, and I've probably been talking too fast. Um, <laughs> the industry, and this finishing is a very difficult industry to de define. Uh, they have an extremely wide range of products, and, and for, all different, uh, for all different effects and so on. Uh, fashion says they want this, and they want this color. Fashion wants this effect. Then you have the specification saying you have to meet this performance and so on. So you, you have a, a whole range of factors which have to be dealt with in the finishing industry. Maybe what I've listed at the bottom is more a continuing of what already is more or less happening. Water-based systems, that's not solvent-free, but water-based free of restricted substances, natural finishes, probably the natural feel type of finishes, um, less finish, upgrading of for covering faults in leather, and soil resistance so the leather doesn't uh, stain or doesn't soil with use. Some of the things, there are a whole range of things going on. I just wanted to touch on a few, a few of many of the examples of chemical innovations which have gone on. Uh, I, I already have mentioned the hair safe, use of enzymes I've mentioned, organic tanning systems I've already mentioned, softening polymers, lightweight filling agents, there's a new one here, solar reflective leather. If you have a piece of leather, undyed leather like this, chrome tan, um, like this, and you put it out in the sunlight, it will reflect the infrared light. So in other words, it will not heat up. So why for a black, fill the leather up with black, and if you put this out in the sunlight, it goes to 85, 80, 85 degrees. Why fill it with substances which will absorb all the infrared light and, and you will have a thing which is very uncomfortable, the motorbike uh, leather suits, the car seats, where the car seat sits in the sun and you sit on it. Why fill it up with a thing which absorbs the infrared light? Because this doesn't. This leather naturally reflects the infrared light. So here you can, you have the same, another piece of black leather, and this reflects the infrared light. This will be 20 to 30 degrees cooler than the other one, only because you've chosen products which allow the natural properties of the leather to reflect the infrared light. So it's a very, simple, at least I think a simple to explain <laughs> innovation, you keep the natural properties of leather by choosing the correct pigments and dyes. It was not easy, but it is possible. Water-based finishes, I talked about roller coating. This was not a, this is to do with the machinery and the chemical industry together. Now I want to go just shortly. How's my time going? Is it okay? Uh, he'll tell me when to stop. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about there's a thing called reach. I won't go into what a reach too much means uh, because I'm sure many, many, many of you know as at least as much, possibly more than me. Um, then there's another thing that some of you might not know very much about called an MRSL and I will talk about that. There are other regulations and restrictions which I have not put up here, but if I put them all up, then the page would be full and, uh, and, and we would still be here in one hour. So let's just concentrate on these two. One of the things, the REACH regulation, which is a European regulation for chemicals, so they took all the chemical regulations that existed and put them in a new regulation and then added bits and pieces on top. Uh, but one of their aims, which sounds really good, 
was to boost innovation and to replace hazardous chemicals with less toxic alternatives. That's really good. But one of the other aspects was that all existing chemical substances that were in Europe or imported into Europe have to be registered. And we, the chemical industry has until, or the importers have until May 2018 to complete this. Already the bigger products have been registered, but we still have thousands. In fact, I saw a figure which said 70,000 substances are still to be registered by 2018. So a good business uh, to be in at the moment is a testing lab. Testing labs are full, full, full. They have no capacity. Uh, if you haven't already started, you'll probably have difficulty getting your results before May 2018. So it's, it's the way it is. Um, but it means there is a large commitment of resources from the chemical suppliers to fulfill this. So at the moment, the, the other innovation, this other thing, innovations, and replacing ha less hazard hazardous chemicals with less toxic alternatives. This at the moment is taking a little bit of a back step in a number of, in quite a few cases. Not all cases, but in, in a number of cases because of the commitment there is to comply with this. The other aspect of REACH is that they are assigning products this new code called SVHC, substances of very high concern. This, you, you can see the, if you go into the ECHO website and put in SVHC, you'll get this list quite easily. There's 163 substances on it now. Every six months, they add more to it. And once a substance has been analyzed and done a, a type of risk analysis on it, everybody's allowed time to, to submit, but relatively short time. It can then be transferred to Annex 14, which is what I mentioned there. And Annex 14 is where it, you can only use it if you have authorization within, by this ECHA group in, based in Finland. So you have this problem. You have to be careful. I keep watching this SVHC list. Already the non-alphenol ethoxylates, which were out earlier, but they are on it. We have borax, the boron compounds have gone on it. So uh, these types of things, some of the things which have been used. We have NMP, which is on it, which was used as a solvent in finishing and so on. So some of these things which are relevant for the industry are coming on this, and you have to keep watching it. OK. How am I going? I've got, I think, one slide. One slide. Thank you. Okay, and I have to just, this is this new one, MRSL, Manufacturing Restricted Substance List. Uh, just to go, I mentioned the 19 brands. You can, see, you can see here at the bottom, these are the 19 brands which are behind this, uh, this thing. Uh, and their aim is to have zero discharge of hazardous chemicals by 2020. They've identified several priority chemicals, and they've now put out, um, we, uh, put out a list called an MRSL. This is for the chemical products. It's not for the leather. You're used to having an RSL from your uh, customer saying what's allowed in the leather. This is now the idea from these brands is that the chemical industry should provide the chemicals to meet these requirements. So this is a list. The textile list already exists. If you go into um, the, what's the ro um, roadmap 2.0 or something, they, they have a website. Uh, if you go in there, you can download all these documents uh, and you can see the textile one. The leather one is about, I think, 90% finished. And unless Elton can correct me, I think it's possibly due out this year. Am I right? Yeah, he says yes. Okay. Um, 
They also have an interesting document on their chemical management systems guidance manual, 70 pages long. So here you have the brands telling the, the textile, this is basically textile, textile industry, how they should be managing their chemicals on top of their restricted substance list. Okay, I've just touched on a few things. It's been an overview, but I, I would like to thank you very much. And uh, that's the finish of my talk. Okay, thank you. Okay.